Why are you putting a banana in her ear? Oh my goodness. Good morning, please be seated, friends. Um, this morning we have a lot of things going on. Uh, it's a little bit loud. Thank you. Um, to, still too loud. Today uh, we are in Pentecost. It's the 17th Sunday after this, see, after the uh, Pentecost Sunday. Um, and the theme of the prayer series, uh, sermon series that we're doing, is in the context of intercession. We're going to be talking about warfare prayer prayer as a spiritual battle. The theme of the gospel readings is repentance, confession and repentance. And in fact, one of our weapons in warfare is repentance. It's one of the primary weapons that the church has. The thing that brings revival is not praise and worship music. It's repentance, true repentance of a, of a cross community. Uh, so would you please stand? Uh, and also today we have a very special uh, dance by the Team Jesus, uh, who are going to be leading us in a special praise during the Grand Jewel this morning. Today is also for the single boy. It's um, a social services Sunday when they ask us to pray for their social services. And to, just to remember, they do huge, huge, huge projects across Hong Kong and Macau, caring for youth, for homeless, for elderly, for mentally handicapped. It's just absolutely humongous. And it's run in our name, in the name of the Anglican Church. And it comes out of the grassroots of parish life uh, in the last hundred years. So it's really a remarkable ministry. And all they ask of us today is to remember them in our prayers. Uh, thank you, uh, Betty. So, 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 The Lord be with you. Let us sing our opening hymn, Trust and Obey.
saying that historically it comes with intercession. When the spirit of intercession washes over our community, when the church begins to come and pray, when we're we close, we, we try to have a prayer meeting and we have one mother and a baby came in one month. Uh, revival happens when uh, a group of people are moved by the spirit of God to intercede for their community. When they're so overwhelmed with concern for the loss that they're willing to come together and to pray. So we need to pray that God will move us and move our hearts. The revival also comes with repentance historically. When we turn from our sins, it's not about swinging from the chandeliers and singing praise the Lord and, and so on. That's a, that's a part of it. it come. Worship comes with revival. But at the heart, it begins in prayer and it begins in repentance. When a community is moved to weep for their sin, the people have become with conviction. Miracles begin to happen. People become converted. Revival is when many people come to faith and come to conversion and baptism. So we want to pray that uh, we will touch heaven and change earth. But we don't do that by, by dancing. We touch heaven and change earth through intercession and through repentance. Those are, this is the touching heaven, changing earth. It's intercession and repentance. This is the things that we need uh, in our life. We're going to sing so many times. Yeah, playing back that music, guys, it's nice to pray an atmosphere. So these are songs that are warfare, and they're songs of repentance. They fit together with the gospel theme of the confession of the weapons, and they fit together with the, the, the message of intercession warfare prayers.
of ages, you have robbed and inspired the mind. You are our fortress and our defense and our protection. We stand, you are the firm foundation. We stand high up upon you as we face at the battles of the world around us. We thank you for your strength that undergirds us. We thank you for your love and compassion that it, 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 it is the strength of our heart. As we meet with you this morning, Jesus, we want to say we love you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we love you and we worship you. We ask, Lord, that you would give us hearts of intercession for the lost, break our heart for the world, for those who don't know you. And we ask that you would grant us our true repentance, that it would wash over us like a flood, that you would move us to, to life of holiness, and to glorify your name. In your name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Dear friends, let us pray this steam prayer for this Sunday. We say together, O oh God, you declare your almighty power, chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace, so that we may come to obtain your promises and become partakers of the heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, please be seated for the Old Testament reading by the Spirit. Basically, the message of the reading is that we are all responsible for our sin and that we need to beware because the wages of sin is death. So it's a, it's a reading of one. Psalms were the songs of the Old Testament, and they were written to the sun. 
And so this morning, instead of just reading the psalm, we're going to sing the first two verses. We're going to ask Alex just to give me a G chord. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so it's quite right. It goes like this. Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Okay, you got the idea, so it's an echo. When we get to the part that says, oh, we sing it all together. Let's try that. Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul? Do I lift up my soul? Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul? Do I lift up my soul? Okay. So let's try that from the top. Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift Let me not be ashamed, let all my enemies 
this song is this? Is this a praise song? No. It's a special kind of song. We call it a warfare song. And how do you know it's a warfare song? Think about the meaning, yeah. Oh, she said because they repeat the words. That's an interesting idea. Because going into battle, they would call to each other back and forth. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, I could make it a warfare song. I was thinking because it speaks about my enemies. So this is someone involved in a battle, in a war, and they're calling for God to rescue them uh, in the battle. It's like, you know, the Lord of the Rings and the orcs that are overwhelming you and killing you, and you're waiting for Gandalf to come over the hill and come down with the sunrise, and you're waiting for God to come and rescue you, and you say, let yea, yes, let none that wait on you, God, be ashamed. So some of us are waiting on God. Some of us are saying, God, where are you? We're in the battle, and we're overwhelmed, and we want to know where you are. And it's saying we will not be ashamed when we wait on you, and our enemies will not triumph over it. So it's a declaration of faith in the midst of a battle. In a minute, um, we're going to have a dance by the children, and that's also absolutely a warfare song. So the children are going to lead us into war, into battle. And, but first, we're going to have the epistle reading, so please be seated for the epistle reading uh, this morning, uh, before we sing the next four verse song. And this is read to us by Lewis. What is here? Did I tell you the new group? Yes.
beginning at verse 23. Glory unto you, Lord Christ. Now when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd. For all, all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. Later he changed his mind and he went. Father went to the second son and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Surely, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Church camp topic on 
prayer, so to speak. So we're very lucky that we can have this time. So please do sign up. Um, the cost is 250 mark. But again, I will just plead with you, please don't let finance stop you from coming. If you can't come, you can't, you can't afford it, that is to say, someone will be more than happy to cover your cost. Of course, it's an honesty system. So we trust you, if you can't afford it, you understand, please sign up and just pay what you can afford. Pay whatever you can afford, okay? That's how the church should be anyway. So, and I just commend to you all of the notices that are in the bulletin, please read them carefully. One correction I want to make from the, the form is that the children's program is not zero to five, it's two to six. So for the non to two, that is the, the, the babies and the one-year-olds, we just have the crash. So I'm sorry, there's no special program for zero to two, it's quite hard to do that. So we have the crash in the hall though. So you can have the crash area all be set up in, in the marquee. Uh, and the children's program is two to six and seven to twelve. The same as we have on camp. We have a lot of kids signed up in the older group. So we need to help us for Pastor Chris and Vivian. There will be two sessions, um, 12.30 to, uh, sorry, 1.30 to 3.30, and then 4 to 5.30. So we need people in both sessions to help, at least one person, to, if not two, to help Pastor Chris and, and Vivian. It's especially essential with the toddlers. If someone has to go to the bathroom, Vivian can't leave. So we need ladies for the early group, please. And we need some people for the old group. So please see me or Vivian. Is Vivian here? Can you just stand up and wave? Pastor Chris, you, I think everyone knows Pastor Chris. You know Vivian's in the back. So please see them or see me uh, if you'd like to volunteer to help them. You will have a lot of fun. You will miss my thoughts. I do know that that might be a blessing. No. Okay. So someone can take that to you. Uh, I also want to uh, just remind you that we really want to start Sunday school for 11 to 14s. Uh, we, we don't have never had a junior high Sunday school. And we feel that the kids are falling through the cracks, and we want to do something for them because they're a bit young for the sermon, maybe, depends on them, but uh, we want to do something special for them. So we need volunteers. So far, John Ortiz and Mandy have volunteered. They're both already doing 15 other things. So thank you, John and Mandy. Today's John's wedding anniversary, by the way, that's why he's not here. But we also need, uh, we need about six people, at least, preferably eight, to do this. So please see me if you can help with the junior high. And what I'm going to do is give you the Youth Alpha video material. You can do the Youth Alpha material with the, those kids. Um, although the Mac kids are looking at the chapel, but it doesn't matter to see them twice. Um, and, and it's a bit late. Okay, so I uh, also want to commend to our young adults group. We now have a young adults group that's been meeting for a month. We have 12 plus young people who are coming. It's dynamic, it's fun. Uh, I recommend your young adult friends that will not be embarrassed. Uh, we have a good time. Uh, Bina is leading it with me and, and Enya and Matt, uh, and, and it's a great, it's a great group. Uh, so please do come and, and help us, um, join us if you're sending your young adults along to join us. One more thing I want to highlight, there's a lot of things in the bulletin, but one thing I want to highlight is that next Saturday is the consecration of our new bishop. Our bishop Paul is retiring, and it will be online, if you look on page, um, page 7 in your bulletin, the website addresses there. You can go to the website and watch the consecration online. Uh, sadly, I will not be watching, don't tell the bishop or I might get in trouble. Uh, I'm going to be packing up the things for camp at that time, very sadly. But it would be good if some of us can watch and pray for the bishop. He will be our new bishop. He's not going to be archbishop unless he gets elected as archbishop. The archbishop is elected from East Calhoun, West Calhoun, which is Archbishop Andrew Chan, Archbishop Timothy, and then uh, the new bishop of us, Hong Kong and Macau, is Archbishop Matthias. So one of the three will be new Archbishop, sorry, Bishop Matthias. One of the three will be the new Archbishop. Probably one of the two older guys, more experienced guys, most likely. And I have to say they're all good, um, especially those two older guys, they're great guys, they're godly men, I'm very happy for either of them to be Archbishop, so please pray for the consecration of our bishop this Friday and understand that we will have a new chief shepherd. This is not my the Anglican polity. The church does not belong to the priest. It is under the bishop. 
So I am the vicar, which means I'm vicarious. I stand in the place of the bishop. So I represent the bishop to you. But actually, it's his fault. It's not my fault. You may not have known that. What a relief for me. Uh, it's still his problem. Uh, okay. So please come um, read the notice in the bulletin. And let's stand. And boys and girls, we're going to sing out this little song. Crystal has sent some great cards along for you. Grace has put them together. And just before you go, I want to say a huge thank you uh, to the music team. I think the reason you missed the verses in the opening end was because you were both for some reason, I believe. Is that right? You guys didn't notice that the hymn numbers because you were the verse numbers. Because you were really, is that right? You spent most of your practice getting raised out of the area. See, that's what they, what they did is very difficult. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but they had men and women singing different parts. So they did it the way it's done in the original song. So the production that they just did for us, including the children, is the most complex praise and worship production we've ever had in the life of the church. And it involved the music team singing different parts, men and women, and the children dance. And I have to say, we have three geniuses that we need to thank. Um, uh, Bia introduced the song to us. Alex, Alex made it fly. And Selena, of course, choreographed and arranged that brilliant banner walk. It wasn't that brilliant? Yeah. It was truly brilliant. Can we give the three of them a few So let's join hands um, with moms and dads and join elbows with um, other people. Oh, too late. All right. Wash your hands later on. <laughs> but see, may God's blessings around you. charge 
of Mac Church. Now today we're going to move on and look at warfare prayer. In the Christian life, we are at war. War has been declared, whether we like it or not. If you have ever read the Chronicles of Narnia, and you begin with the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, the four Pevensey children enter the winter-struck wood of Narnia, and they find a country deeply buried under war. An alien power, the White Witch, has conquered Narnia, and she has proclaimed herself queen, but she is a pretender to the throne, which belongs to Aslan, the great king. And Aslan has been absent for hundreds of years, and he, his kingdom has been overrun by forces of darkness and evil. This is, of course, an allegory that C.S. Lewis wrote for children to help them understand that when we are come into the world, we are already at war. When you are baptized, you are baptized into the army of God. And you are reminded with the metaphor that you are a soldier of Christ and that he is the captain, he is your captain, he is your commander in the spiritual battle of the Christian life that lies ahead. Many of us have forgotten this truth or we are complacent about it, or it's not something we're comfortable with, or it's not present in our awareness. But I want to remind you, I challenge you today, that we enter and live in occupied territory. It's like after World War II, when the uh, Japanese Imperial Army had surrendered because of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But all over the Pacific uh, warfare arena, there were units of Japanese soldiers who were still fighting and who were still shooting and were still deadly. deadly. And indeed, until the 70s, they, they discovered in the 1970s, when I was a teenager, one Japanese soldier who had been in the jungle in the Philippines, I believe, holding, does anybody remember that on the news or am I the only one that's so old? Thank you, Helen. Um, and so, it's only us. <laughs> They found this poor guy, he'd been there from 1945 to 1975, 30 years, and he thought Japan was still at war with the Allies. Because he was there hiding in the jungle and he thought he was under warfare in the deep jungle. So while we believe that Jesus conquered Satan's sin and death at Calvary, mocking up operations are still going on. There are still battles going on across the arena of war, across the world. And Satan is described as the prince of this world. Now that word world means the sinful world, the fallen world. It doesn't mean the world that God loves, which is you and I, and the people on earth. But it means the world which is um, permeated uh, by sin. He is the prince of this, of that world, which of course we inhabit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, St. Paul writes, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Um, what Jesus at one time said to, to the, uh, his followers, to, to the crowd, um, my, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my followers would fight to establish my rule. He made it really clear in many occasions that he was not establishing an earthly kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom and a heavenly kingdom. Sorry for the fire, I'm reorienting my body here. So, uh, we are, our weapons are not, we don't fight physically. And sometimes Christians have misunderstood this. During the Crusades, when the church was extremely hard pressed, uh, the Islamic conquerors hammered Eastern Europe with hundreds and hundreds of battles. They were slaving all across the Mediterranean, taking slaves. The history is horrendous. And they were overrunning uh, the Christian communities uh, in the Eastern Roman Empire. And so some stupid pope had the idea that it would be a good idea to steal a page out of Muhammad's book and to suggest to the Christian folk, simple ignorant people in those days, mostly illiterate, that if they went to war for Jesus, they would immediately go to paradise. So he told them that they could get their sins forgiven and a free ticket to heaven. Now that's absolutely unchristian. 
Uh, unfortunately, he actually took the theology of his enemies to fight against them. Uh, they were in very dire circumstances at the time. And one can understand, no one can understand. It was just horrendous. And um, so it, it made a great damage. And, and today we're still living that down, as you know. Uh, but in fact, they faced overwhelming, relentless attacks from the East. And uh, it was a huge mistake because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. My followers are not called to fight. Jesus said that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That is, they're not physical. They're not of the flesh. But they are mighty in God. What the popes should have done is called the nations, the nations to prayer. And, of course, the government should have been separated from the church. That was a problem as well. Uh, but it says in Paul that our weapons are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So we are Christians. We are at war. And it's a spiritual battle, not against people or ideologies, but it's a battle against evil, against Satan and sin and death. The Christian evangelist John Piper wrote, Life is war. Our weakness in prayer is owed largely to our neglect of this truth. So in other words, he says we're weak in prayer because we don't understand that the stakes are high and that we're in a battle. Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie, says John Piper. For the mission of the church, as it advances in battle against the powers of darkness and unbelief. Now, for us, I think that probably doesn't really describe most of our prayer lives. We don't, we don't have a sense that we're in a battle, and that our prayers are essential for the winning of the battle. Um, let me get my notes back in order. Forgot to reshuffle them after the first service. Um, Okay. So Christian life happens um, in a war zone. Jesus said, I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, of hell, will not prevail against it. What does that mean? Well, one thing it might mean is that, God, is that Christ is building his kingdom on the border of hell. And the second thing it means is that the army of Christ is assailing, is attacking the gates of hell. So we are on the attack in this battle, according to this metaphor. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. That is to say, one of our missions is to beat down the gates of hell, and to retrieve, to plunder hell for the souls of those who are lost, for those who don't know the Lord, who don't know His salvation, who are outside of the grace of Christ. So it's a very powerful metaphor. And most of us are happy to sit back and, you know, live our comfortable lives and enjoy our lifestyle and, you know, have our holidays and eat our buffet and I go stay on one of them. And that's why I wanted to do this sermon series, to stir myself up and to stir all of us up again, that prayer is the Christian life. It is the Christian life. And, and part of that is, is warfare prayer, the intercession of warfare prayer, that we are called to fight for souls. So instead of prayer being a walkie-talkie in battle, our, our prayer has become an intercom at Club Men, asking God to give us parking spaces. And I, you know, I'm the number one culprit. Have you ever prayed for a parking space? I have many times. I mean, there's something kind of beautiful about that. When the world around us is going to hell in a handbasket, and we're praying for parking spaces to improve the quality of our life. So, you understand? So not to, I don't want to make you feel bad, I want to diminish you. I'm speaking to myself always in this. And I'm trying to raise our sights. That the prayer is given to us as a walkie-talkie in battle against the enemy, against Satan, and the, and the powers of darkness, and the power of evil, and the darkness which prevents people from seeing the gospel. And I confess how many times I've come to school chapel without praying. I confess how many times we try to do Alpha without prayer. How many times I've come to youth group without first interceding or church in the morning, Sunday morning for that matter. We can't even rally a church prayer meeting. We tried for six weeks to have a church prayer meeting and one lady and an infant turned up. So that means that we have work to do. It means that we need to ignite the passion of intercession in our individual and corporate lives for the cow, for the lost, uh, for the spiritual fight, because it's not just for the lost, it's also to overcome spiritual strongholds. 
The scriptures talk about demonic strongholds in the community. There's no question, I think, that Macau has a demonic stronghold in Britain. There's no question that there is a spiritual force in Macau, which is in my just life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's all right, I'm loud. So um, I think it's the battery's died, so I'm going to give it to Matt, and it's going to give it to Tina at the back. Thank you. Um, never mind, I have a backup plan. You know, in war, you always need a backup plan, right? You need a generator or something to keep you going. It's okay, we don't need that to agree. So, um, we need to stir ourselves up. In 1 Timothy 6, 12, the Apostle Paul challenges the church, fight a good fight of faith. And we turn that into a joke about marriage. We say, I'll fight the good fight. You know, that means fight with your wife or your husband. We call that the good fight, because it's the marital fight. It's a joke, I know. It's a good joke, actually. It works. Uh, sometimes we fight the good fight, don't we? But actually, it's got nothing to do with marriage. He's talking about spiritual warfare, the intercession of the church. That we need to, I mean, when was the last time you got on your knees to pray for the lost? Thank you. When is the last time you got on your knees? I'm just going to leave this off now. Just one minute. When is the last time you passionately interceded against a demonic stronghold, against someone who was profoundly sick? Uh, I mean, I'm asking for people to sign up to fast and pray for Ellis, and I can't even cover it seven days in a week. Now that's, you know, not a condemnation of you. I have trouble fasting one day. I have trouble fasting one meal. We're all in the same boat with this. But we need to do better. We need to lift our game as a church if we're going to make a greater impact for the kingdom on this city and on our community. And on, you know, we want God to, we want it to be easy. We want God to bless our families and help our lives. But we don't want to pay the price. We don't want to come to church regularly. We don't want to be passionate about the things of the kingdom. We just want God to bless us when we ask Him. We must light the fire of zeal and of passion that stirs us up out of Christianity, which is concerned with our own comfort and lifestyle. This is the only way that we can win the battle for the lost and indeed overcome the strongholds of the enemy. Now, there are four levels of intercession that I want to share with you this morning. So you're a soldier of Christ, we're living in a war zone. I want to come to the four things, and um, I need to watch my time there today. So level one, it's like um, different levels of military service, okay? Level one is what I, I mean, all of you would see, as you can see, circumstantial intercession. Circumstantial intercession is where you're maybe a civilian, and your country is at war, and suddenly, the, the battle comes to your town. And before you know it, the enemy is coming up the road towards your house. And you have to get your old hunting rifle out, and you have to take up a position and, and, and do some sniping, or you have to deal with a problem. Maybe there's an infiltrator or something that you've encountered from the enemy. So actually you're a civilian, you're not really in the battle, but you encounter a problem. Someone gets sick, someone, uh, there's a, I, I was talking to someone this morning who had, a, I think, a demonic confrontation in their, in their family life because the, the one partner is from a Christian background and the other partner is from a non-Christian background. So they had a conflict of values where the, one, the Christian partner was saying, we can't do that as a family, that's, that's wrong, it's immoral. And the other person was saying, yes, we can. And if you love me, you will do that. And what, what they were asking the Christian to do was, was wicked and immoral. And the Christian said, I can't do that. You know, so this is an example of circumstantial conflict. So in other words, the enemy brings the battle into your backyard. And you haven't really been involved in the battle, but suddenly the battle's in your backyard. And you're dealing with a demonic confrontation, because that is a demonic confrontation. It's a, it's a confrontation of values of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And what do you do? Well, the weapons of our warfare are not come. So we don't curse our partner, but we, we get on our knees and we intercede for them and we shower them with love and we, we try to help them to see. Of course, you might find that it's an ongoing struggle in a situation like that. But we may encounter someone who is uh, addicted. We may have a friend who's addicted to drugs. We may have a friend who's addicted to stealing. We may have a friend who's struggling with gambling. We may encounter a situation at work where there is injustice and evil. Uh, we may encounter oppression and deception in our employers. And so we go into battle. So we become 
what we call in Australia weekend warriors. We're not really soldiers, we're not really in the army, but every now and again the battle comes to us, so we put in our jungle greens and we sally forth and we have a shot and we you know, do a little battle, uh, so we are circumstantial warriors. And, we, and I, I would say there's nothing wrong with that. All of us are in that situation, and every circumstance that you encounter where there's a conflict between Christian faith and values, or the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, is an opportunity to enter into battle. And we are called, as soldiers of Christ, to bring the light of Christ into dark and difficult situations. And the way we do that is to get on our knees. The way we do that is with repentance. Why, that's why we sang the songs at the beginning of the service about repentance. Actually, the theme of the readings of, of confession repentance and obedience and the theme of prayer and intercession fit together. Because one of our weapons in the warfare, one of our primary weapons, is confession, repentance, and obedience. If, if we want uh, God to fight on our side, we need to be uh, in a right relationship with the commander. And the way we do that is through confession, repentance, and obedience. You can't expect the commander, the, the general of the army, to be on your side if you are disobeying orders. If you're disobeying the king's orders, you can't expect him to fight on your behalf. Or to be, you know, you're, you're, you're basically able, you're absent without leave. So you see that confession, repentance, and obedience connect to warfare. Um, that's why I said the foundation of revival is uh, confession, repentance, confession, and intercession. They, they go together to lay the foundation. And historically, I'm talking historically. When revival comes in community, when you see hundreds of thousands of people coming to Christ in a community, it's because people get on their knees and they weep for their sins. It's not because they sweep from the chandeliers and sing hallelujah. That comes as a byproduct of the repentance and, and the joy and the forgiveness and so on as the, the river of the Spirit flows. But it begins with repentance. It begins with intercession. We have to pray the price for the, the, the kingdom. So. The first level is circumstantial uh, intercession, circumstantial warfare. There is a reason, as we said last week, why you are placed where you are. You have a unique circle of influence. So you can intercede for your children, for your employees, for your contacts, for your parents, for whoever it is that God, for your helper, whatever it is that God is, whoever it is that God has put around you, your students. You're in that situation, so you can enter into circumstantial warfare. You can enter into battle for them and pray for them. You can pray for the kingdom to come. You can pray for the powers of darkness, for the influence of the enemy to be broken. You can pray, pray for blind eyes to be opened. Uh, you can pray for healing to come. Signs of the kingdom are, are healing and forgiveness and, and freedom for people to be set free from things that bind them up. So circumstantial intercession. The second one is Sifti. Does anybody know what Sifti means? Okay. So simply is, can I pray for you? That's the second level of warfare. You see, that's not just sitting in your foxhole waiting for the enemy to come to you. It's not just sitting there and saying, well, when a problem arises, I'll, I'll intercede about it. You know, when I see that my friend that is addicted and in trouble, I will fast and pray for them. I will get into the battle and shoot some bullets for them. That's just circumstantial response. But simply means you're going on the offense. Now, I have certain Christian friends who do this all the time. They're on a bus. I, I had this friend in Hong Kong. I, I had a client says she's still on my Facebook. And she was an evangelist and an intercessor. And she would all the time talk to ladies on buses. She would talk to ladies in her gym class, talk to ladies in the swimming class, talk to ladies in the music appreciation, whatever she was. She would, in the shopping center, she would talk to ladies generally that she would meet. And she would start telling them their, their testimony, their testimony. And then she would always ask them about them, and ask them about their lives, and they would talk about their problems, and their husbands, and their children. And then she would go, Sifti. Not really. She would say, can I pray for you? And do you know what? People almost never say no. Even the, the hardest pagans, if you say, you know, I'm, and then you do it in a natural way, that's not awkward or gush. One of the problems is the Christians that have the zeal to do this often don't have the sensitivity. The Christians that have the sensitivity 
don't do it. They don't have a go. But they need to. Because we leave it to the insensitive Christians. We have insensitive Christian friends, you all know what I'm talking about, who will be, you know, coming in people's face and, and bringing in religion and can I pray for you? We have to find a natural connection in the conversation. We wait until the right moment in the conversation. Sometimes people will set me up to meet a friend and they're like, tell them about Jesus, tell them about Jesus, tell them about Jesus. And I'm like, I just want to let them know I'm a normal human being first. I just want to have a meal and have a joke. And then as the evening wears on, the opportunity will naturally arise in conversation, if we're following Christ, to share a testimony in a natural way. The thing is that those of us that have sensitivity don't have the courage to sit feet. And the ones that are insensitive have the courage to sit feet. So we need to be, have the courage to be, to be sensitive and at the right moment, towards the end of the evening, to say to your friends, very naturally, hey, would you mind if I pray for you? I'd really like to just say a prayer about that situation that we've been talking about, you know, with your kids or with your husband or with the school or whatever it is. And people are touched this week. Um, Pastor Chris and I were talking to a friend who had a tragedy in their family. And we were doing the normal things that you do, saying, I'm sorry to hear about your loss and my condolences. And, you know, we're so sorry. And I'm sure it was a great person and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, we said, Sipfi, can we pray for you? And we laid hands on his shoulder, and he said, oh, yeah, that would be great. And we prayed for him. And then he sent me a message later on, a day or two later. And he didn't say, I was really touched by your condolences. He said, thank you for praying for me. He said, I was so moved by your prayer. It meant so much to me. strengthened me. And when you prayed about this, about my family member, it really spoke to me. See, this prayer penetrates penetrates the hearts. So that's a little offensive warfare. So you get out of the foxhole to sit in there like circumstantially responding to problems. Get out of the foxhole and simply talk to someone and say, can I pray for you? So you're taking the offense. And it's very powerful. Don't underestimate the power of this. It's very, it's very powerful. The Lord can use it. And, and it opens up another time when you see them. Um, if they turn and go the other direction, then they probably don't want any more sympathy. <laughs> Uh, but generally people don't. Generally, if you do it naturally and appropriately, they appreciate it. Um, I would just say, don't bring it in the first five minutes of the conversation. Okay, let the conversation run naturally and warmly. Have a joke, have a laugh. And things will arise in the conversation. And then it becomes natural to say, hey, before we go tonight, can I just pray for you? Uh, and it's a very, very powerful thing to do. And it opens them up. This is how this is famous guy, David Bennett, who was a very strong... Uh, lobbyist in Australia, a very anti-Christian lobbyist, um, and, and David, well, uh, well, he was in, in the media all the time, uh, fighting against Christians, he hated Christians, and he came from a family of Christians, and he hated Christians, and, and he, um, he, he went um, to, he went to meet with a girl who uh, had made a video about handicapped people, and he was so touched by this video, it was such a good video about helping handicapped people, so he interviewed her for his journalism. And um, he said, oh, why, why did you, what moved you to be so concerned for these handicapped people to make this beautiful video? And she said, oh, it's because of Jesus. I, I love Jesus, and I feel Jesus compels me to help those in need. And he said, ah, gee, and I'm a crazy Christian. And she said, no, she said, you, you don't understand. She said, you know, Jesus loves you so much. And she said, she said, Sethi, you understand, hated Christians. He spent the last tens of years of his life attacking Christians in universities, in journals, in, in newspapers. And, and, she, and she was saying, can I pray for you, Sydney? And they were alive in a pub in England, London. And he, she was so sweet and so genuine. He said, okay, okay, okay. And she laid her hand on his shoulder. She prayed, come Holy Spirit. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had a deep, profound encounter with the presence of God. He said he felt overwhelmed by the love of God. He said he never felt that God loved him before. He never heard that God loved him, he said. I find that hard to believe, but he, he said he never heard that God loved him. Thanks, David Bennett, you can Google him. And he gave his life to Christ. And then he went home, his mother was a Christian, she'd been praying for him for a long time. And he got home and he said, you know, Mama, he was different. She said, what's, what's happened? You're different. He said, I've, I've found Christ. You've been telling me all these years. And, 
I didn't believe you. I, I hated Christianity. And he said, I experienced it. And now I understand what you're talking about. And um, she said, that's amazing. He said, what's amazing? He said, don't, she said, don't you remember? Three months ago, we were having Christmas dinner. And your uncle, Santo Anandi, were crazy Christian, Pentecostals. And at the dinner, he had a fight with his uncle and auntie about Christianity. And his uncle, when he was stormed out of the room, and his uncle said to his mom and dad, uh, after he stormed out of the room, I see the presence of the Holy Spirit all over him. And in three months to the day, he will give his life to Christ. And that day was exactly three months after his uncle made that prophecy. And he forgot about it. His mother reminded him. He's like, oh, yeah, wow. He gave his life to Christ. Actually, I don't know if you knew you had to go and listen to the story. But um, it's an amazing testament. And it just happened for Sethi. Because some, some girl who made a beautiful video was having a conversation in a pub and said to this Christian-hating man, journalist, can I pray for you? And the Holy Spirit turned up. And, it, and he's now studying theology in Oxford under N.T. Ryan. It's an amazing story. So, number three. I need to get on and finish so we can pray. Um, the, the next level of intercession. Oh, by the way, I actually had a friend who was on a plane once. And he was sitting next to Henry Winkle. You know who Henry, Henry Winkle is? You know Henry Winkle, the American actor? Have you heard of the Fonz? Happy Days? Oh my goodness, I'm old. Okay. <laughs> Happy Days was a TV program in the 70s. There was this character called Fonzie, for Arthur Fontarelli. Whenever the girls would come in, into the diner, Fonzie would go, ah, and all the girls would gather around. Fonz was very, very, he was the coolest person on earth to see in the program. Anyway, my friend sat next to him on the plane. I was talking to Henry Winkler, who was a famous movie star, and he said, Henry, Sophie. And Henry said, yeah, sure, man, you can pray for me. So he, 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 Henry shared something he needed prayer for, and he signed uh, my friend's Bible, and he, he got to pray for Henry Winkler. So you know, you never know uh, how your prayer can be sent. So this, the, the second level um, of intercession that I want to talk about um, is the level called and committed. This means that maybe intercession is your spiritual gift. Maybe you have a call to warfare prayer. Uh, we talked about spiritual gifts last year. And this is the I want to intercede level. I want to go to battle. I want to sign up. I want to go through basic training. I want to do this. It's like you have a desire to intercede uh, in your heart. And maybe you use the, the you want to use a petitional prayer or ripple prayer. You, you want to get involved in, in interceding uh, for, for the lost. And there are many, um, many Christians who will have a, a, a list of prayer, they can topical prayer or, or ripple prayer or different ways of praying. And every day they will pray for one of their relatives. Every day they will pray for a different topic. And they will pray through, through their list. And you know, my father and my godfather, I, I'm, I'm a lousy prayer. I don't have this gift. And I need more of it. That's why I'm doing the sermon series. But um, my father and godfather were great intercessors. My father prayed for us every day of his life, and I think mom as well. My godfather was the Archbishop of Melanesia. He was a single man, never married, and he prayed for me every day of his life. And I often sometimes wonder, God, why have you been so good in my life? Why have I had so many blessings? Why have I seen you move in so many wonderful ways in my life? And I think it's got nothing to do with me. I think it's to do with the fact that my godfather and my father and my mother from the time I was an infant, invest in prayers. Don't ask me to be your child's godfather. I am the world's worst godfather because I am not an intercessor. If you want a godfather or a godmother, ask an intercessor. Because you want someone who every day is going to get on their knees and put prayers in the back of heaven for that child. And I can go back home to our place in Canberra and look up Dad's prayer journals and see how he was praying for us every day. My wife does the same thing. She's an intercessor. Praying every day, writing out her prayers. What a gift to be able to give to the church and to others. So if you have any calling to be an intercessor, fulfill your calling, enter into it. Uh, and it's a great gift to, to people to be an intercessor. Level four um, is the career intercessor. Now you might think this is weird. I've never heard of anybody who had a career of praying. But actually, have you heard of monks and nuns? 
Monks and nuns are career intercessors. That's what they do. They pray, you know, six times a day. And there are certain monks and nuns who lock themselves away in a cell, and all they do, they don't read all, they just pray eight hours a day. And you know what? There's a prayer movement in the world today of evangelical Christians who are churches who are employing intercessors. You know, we were meeting in the Presbyterian Church. You remember Cumberland Presbyterian Church? You remember that? They have a full-time intercessor. I think that the first person they employed on staff, if I am correct, was a woman who is a full-time intercessor. She leads worship and she prays. She's there at the church all day in seating and praying. And they have also set prayer times when she leads worship and prayer. People just come in and pray. So it was such a priority for Cumberland Presbyterian Church, they employed, not a youth worker, not an evangelist, they employed a full-time intercessor. That kind of blows my mind. But it just makes you realize that there's more of this going on than you know. In America, in Kansas City, there's a place called the House of Prayer. And uh, people come from all over America and around the world, and they pray through the nations of the world systematically. They pray for the tribes, they pray for the lost people in the world, they pray for the governors and the leaders of the problems in the world. And there are hundreds of people who go there who are career intercessors, who pray all day. Now you say, Stephen, this is a bit weird. Well, it's in the Bible. If you look at Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 39, we encounter in Luke chapter 2, two career intercessors who are in the temple in Sidon. Who were they? Have you ever heard of Simeon and Anna? It's a Christmas story. There was the old priest Simeon, and there was the old lady Anna, and she was an elderly and a widow, and, and she just stays, the two of them would spend their days in the temple interceding. And the reward for their intercession is they were the first ones who saw the infant Christ. They were the first ones to prophetically identify that he was the Messiah. So when they met Mary and Joseph with the baby Jesus, they knew prophetically that this was the Messiah that he was going to be the one who was going to save his people from their sins. And if you look up Luke chapter 2, you can see that they prophesy, uh, and there's the Song of Simeon, they prophesy over the, over the child. These were career intercessors. They were people who were spending their life in church praying. Now, it may not be, obviously, many of us who are called to do that, but probably there are some frustrated career intercessors out there who would like to be just praying for hours every day. And we need that in the church. We need people like that. Because, you know, I, it's not my great personal gift. And we need people who can do that. I want to close this morning with a testimony from Yomi Cho himself. Um, um, David Yomi Cho, the pastor of the Oedo Church in Korea, which proved to be the largest church in the world, still by far. Um, the story is told about him that he was having a private meeting with some pastors in which he was sharing his intercessory experience. And he told about an occasion when he went to a Muslim country to preach. And the local chief of police, it was a uh, fully uh, Islamic uh, Sharia law based country. And under Sharia, it's illegal to evangelize with Christian evangelism. In fact, the punishment for a Muslim if you leave Islam under Sharia is death uh, in most Islamic jurisprudence. You leave, the consequence is death. And because this was a country under Islamic law, somebody would carry it out. It didn't have to be the government. Could be the youth group, the local youth group would come and kill you. Um, because it was it was God's law, Sharia law. You leave Islam, you can get killed. And if you evangelize, you can also be killed. So the chief of police came, and there were this, there was a huge study. Hundreds of people came to see the great Christian pastor. Now that's okay. Muslims are allowed to come and hear Christians. Um, they just can't become Christians. And actually, as you know, Muslims honor Jesus, they call him Isa. They honor him as a prophet of healing. So the chief of police said, just come and tell your stories about miracles. Come and tell stories about Isa, about the healing of Isa and the miracles of Isa. We know you have many stories to tell, so just come and do that. But you can't preach the Christian gospel. If you preach the gospel, somebody will kill you. And they had all the security guards there. So Dr. Cho said, thank you very much. And he got up on the podium and he began to speak. And what he said was, as he began, I want you to know this evening that God loves you. He loves you so much, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, into the world to die on the cross for your sin. The only way that you can get to heaven is to accept Christ as your Savior tonight. He went on out swinging with, you know, uh, uh, swinging with the sword of the gospel. 
And um, that evening, at the end of the message, she gave a, an altar call. All of the security guards and the leader of the local, the local mayor all came forward to give their lives to Christ that night. And they all were born again. What an incredible experience and testimony. But he was risking his life and their lives. And so somebody asked him in the meeting when he was sharing, how can you do that? Weren't you afraid? Isn't that reckless? He smiled, as Cho, Cho does. He's always understated. And he quietly said, I have a secret. Yongi Cho said, I have 3,000 full-time intercessors back at my prayer mountain in Korea interceding for me that night. There were 3,000 full-time intercessors on their knees interceding for the lost people in that rally. So he was not afraid to die for Christ. He was not afraid to ignore the advice of the chief of police. He was plugged into a power source which we can't imagine. But we can draw on some of that power. I'll close with, I said I'll close with that, I'll close with this. We need to connect with the power of the Holy Spirit, and we do it through intercession, through prayer, through heart fasting, and through holy living. Once uh, my father was, you know, believed in this ministry and in, in a healing it. And um, he, when my father was in his last parish, there was a there was an evangelical pastor across the valley, and, a, and a, a woman came into the church who was demonized, and she was screaming in a man's voice, like a demonic voice. Very rare in Australia for something like this to happen. It's very rare. It happens a lot in India, in Indonesia, in countries that are more connected to the pagan world. It doesn't happen much in Australia. And the local Anglican evangelical pastor, for all his love of scripture, and his knowledge of scripture was completely out of his depth. He, he didn't know what to do. So he called my dad, who's an elder, he was the principal of the Bible college, and he was experienced in deliverance ministry. And he called dad, David, and he said, David, can you help? I, I, I know my dad. And uh, Dave, dad came over, and the priest was in the sanctuary of the church with the demonized uh, person screaming, a woman screaming, and a man's voice, and, and cursing, cursing, cursing. And uh, dad walked into the room, and she looked up and said, Rob, you're powerful, aren't you? And he said, yes, I am. And he said, you shall you be silent in Jesus' name. He silenced it. And it went silent. Because he wasn't talking to a woman, he was talking to Dina. Dina looked up and said, oh, you're powerful. He said, yes, I am. Shut up in Jesus' name. That's what Jesus said when he silenced the wind and the storm. The word in Greek means shut up. It means he throttled it. He squeezed his throat, he throttled it. That said, be silent in Jesus' name. And he prayed and cast, cast out the demon. And it was effective. The woman was set free. Amazing story. So, but Dad could do that because Dad was holy and he spent his life on his knees. Gotta tell you, I'm not that holy. Maybe Pastor Chris is. My wife certainly is, so call her. Got any demons like that? Call my wife. <laughs> Um, but we can all, we can, we can all connect with the power of God, the power of the Spirit. Now I want to invite you to get into a small group. Can we just get into a small group for five minutes, just for three, three or four? Yeah.
frustrated intercessor? Are you called to be an intercessor? If you think of the military metaphor, be creative. So where are you in the battle? Where are you in the battle? Are you hiding in the bathroom? Um, where are you in the battle? Are you asleep on your bunk? Do you understand the question? Think of the military metaphor. Where are you? Are you in basic training? Have you been called up? Are you absolutely out leave? Are you running away? The other group, run away, run away. Where are you in the battle? Okay? Don't take too long. We don't have too long. Go. Can't have groups of five or six. There is a time. Okay, you should have done that now. Um, can you, it doesn't take too long to say who you are, can you just uh, pray for, is there something or someone who needs deliverance? Is it you? You need, you need deliverance. Is there a stronghold in your life or the life of a loved one? A spiritual stronghold that's like sickness or uh, evil or conflict, uh, addiction. Is there something that's powerful that needs to be broken spiritually? Uh, but we don't have long, we only have five minutes before the children return. So you each have one minute to share and pray. Sorry about that. So it's literally 30 seconds to share, 30 seconds to pray.
歸咁做。Let's uh, draw together to confess our sins as we come to prepare the table of the Lord. Jesus said, Come to me, all you the weary, and the heavy. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. As we have been talking about confession, 
Let us sincerely confess our sin against God and our neighbor as we pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be. We may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Dear friends, hear these words of absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sin through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. Um, as we come to the bringing of peace, I just want to say a final closing word of warning. Uh, it's very important as a church, as we move into this territory, that you take Jesus' words to heart, to pray, deliver us from evil. Every morning I would pray, Lord, deliver us from evil. It's a very important prayer. And also, don't go around telling crazy people to shut up. You might get a black eye. You need to know what you're doing. We're going to sing. Uh, uh, let's uh, sing the Lord gives peace. Lord
we say together, your song is the greatness.
stand up for sing our voice again, uh, we shall stand. Please just sign up for the retreat if you haven't yet. But can I ask the welcome team to be ready now at the table? Because people may be leaving. save this? Anyone know how to save this? Who knows how to save this? Oh, never mind. I'll just finish.